recall the events of May 1970. For those of you who do not, American military forces at President Nixon's direction in collaboration with our South Vietnamese allies invaded Cambodia. In turn, there were numerous demonstrations, particularly on college campuses in this country, against this invasion. In recognition of this public outcry, WOI, AM, and FM devoted nearly an entire day to a series of discussions by lay and academic people in the immediate vicinity. The subject of these discussions was the United States' role in Southeast Asia. It so happened that I participated in one of these panel discussions and found myself answering the question why a succession of presidents could pursue basically similar policy in Vietnam. I was gratified when a short time later I read an article in Foreign Affairs Quarterly in which our guest this evening presented essentially the same argument in answering that question uh, that I had advanced that day. It is not every day that I find someone as distinguished as this speaker who is in agreement with something with which I am identified. So I feel particularly honored this evening to, momentarily at least, share the stage with him. And it certainly is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Mr. Townsend Hoops to you. Townsend Hoops was born in Duluth, Minnesota in 1922. In the 40s, he graduated from Yale University. It was 1947 that he was first introduced to foreign military affairs when he served as assistant to the House, to the chairman of the House Committee on Armed Services. Eighteen months later, at the request of James V. Forrestal, then America's first Secretary of Defense, Mr. Hoops joined the staff at the Pentagon. He served in various capacities, Forrestal, and Forrestal's three successors, uh, Lewis Johnson, the esteemed George Marshall, and Robert Levitt. In early 1953, he left the government, and for the next 11 years, he was engaged in private business. During this period, however, he occasionally served as a consultant to the White House, to the State and Defense Departments on such matters as the organization of the National Security Council, overseas military bases, and U.S. information programs abroad. Also in 1957, he served as executive secretary to the military panel of the Rockefeller Brothers Special Study Project, which produced in 1958 the Rockefeller Panel Reports on Defense Policy and Strategy. Now the report of the panel on which Mr. Hoop served, which happened to be one of six, was published in January of 1958 was entitled International Security, the Military Aspect. Uh, included in this, in this report was a section devoted to uh, the Middle East in which the members uh, termed uh, Soviet activity there as concealed aggression. Now these reports were subsequently published in rather inexpensive paperback edition and I think personally that they still have some value to members of this, of this audience. In January of 1965, Mr. Hoops returned to Washington as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. Uh, in this capacity, uh, his primary, or one of his responsibilities at least, was uh, interest in concern for the Middle East. From October of 1967 to February 1969, he served his government as Under Secretary of the Air Force. Later that year, he published the highly acclaimed The Limits of Intervention, which analyzes the retreat from escalation in Vietnam by the Johnson administration, culminating in Johnson's announcement in March of 1968 when Johnson took himself out of the presidential race. Uh, for those of you who have not read this book, I heartily commend it to you. 
Presently, Mr. Hoops is a scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, there he is writing a book on the Eisenhower Dulles foreign policy, uh, the primary focus of which is on uh, John Foster Dulles, Eisenhower's Secretary of State. Tonight, Mr. Hoops has chosen to speak to us on a topic uh, about which he is eminently qualified to speak, namely the smoldering crisis in the Middle East. Following his remarks, you may direct questions to him. Without further ado, uh, Mr. Thompson Hoops. Professor Kahneman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. During a brief uh, interlude this afternoon, I suppose you might call it a general meeting attended by a massive crowd of seven students, I was approached by a, by a young man who asked me to sign a paper authorizing him to tape this whatever I say tonight. And I, it contains some very interesting language which I wanted to share with you just as a means of getting into the subject. It says, it is understood that WOI is authorized to edit my presentation for the sole purpose of conforming to time limitation or to eradicate long periods of embarrassing silence. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Cotman told me at dinner uh, that he uh, was now contracted for uh, to write uh, either a biography of Calvin Coolidge uh, or an interpretation of some of his papers. And speaking of long silences, uh, I was reminded of a short story. It's a story about Mr. Coolidge uh, receiving his first paycheck as president. You must remember that this was the pre-computer age, and the chief clerk of the Treasury therefore presented himself at the White House attired in striped trousers and a morning coat. He was ushered into the Oval Office and into the presidential presence. He handed the check across the desk, and there then ensued a terrible five minutes of progressively embarrassing silence. Finally, unable to bear the weight of the silence any longer, the chief clerk began edging his way backwards out of the office. Just about the time he reached the door jam, the president looked up smiled happily at the check and said, please come again. <laughs> I had the honor, when I was much younger, uh, to work for a man named James Forrestal, who was the first Secretary of Defense, but who had been, as you recall, Secretary of the Navy during the Second World War. He was a, an ardent admirer of Winston Churchill, and was indeed fascinated by the Prime Minister's command of the English language. As Secretary of the Navy, he had occasion to see him at conferences, but I think more likely at social intervals during the war. And one day he said, Mr. Prime Minister, when you stand in the well of the House of Commons and launch into one of those long, marvelous, rolling periods, how do you know where to insert the verb? or if indeed, when you have finished, whether you remembered to insert the verb. The great man gave him rather short shrift. He waved him abruptly aside and said, young man, I don't concern myself any longer with technique. I simply stand up, launch into a subject with conviction. When I hear myself coming to the end of a sentence which is completed grammatically, I sit down. And I will try to take that as my guide this evening uh, as we go through a rather long, a rather abstruse, a rather inconclusive subject. I didn't really choose the title tonight. It was chosen by the authorities here at school. I'm delighted to speak to it, and I think to call it the smoldering crisis in the Middle East is appropriate. Smoldering connotes a situation that is slow burning but strongly fueled and capable of bursting suddenly into dangerous explosion. The present situation, I think, is obviously dangerous. But I think that perhaps more than dangerous, it is complicated, inconclusive, 
and discouraging. By way of getting into some of the hard present issues, I'd like to take you briefly uh, through a summary of some of the highlights of the last 20 years to put in context the issues that now confront us. The creation of Israel in 1948 was in retrospect, I think, inevitable. And the role played by the United States in the creation of that small country has made our Middle Eastern policy ever since an exercise in unavoidable ambiguity. On the one hand, we are committed to the survival and the maintenance of Israel. On the other, our strategic interests in the area, which I would define briefly as transit, access, and oil, require at least reasonably good relations with the more populous Arabs who live there. The result is that we have necessarily been opposed to seeing either side become too strong, and it is an uncomfortable stance. It was also a situation handmade for Soviet intervention. For having no ties of sentiment with Israel, the Soviets were free to intervene on behalf of the Arabs and to back the Arabs from roughly 1949 onward. Consequential Soviet intervention, I think, dates from 1955, uh, punctuated by the Soviet-Egyptian arms deal, about which we'll talk in a moment. Uh, the opportunity provided the Soviets grew out of the revolution in Egypt in 1952 when the inefficient and corrupt monarchy of King Farouk was overthrown by the military junta of rather young and idealistic military officers led, as you know, by Lieutenant Colonel Gamal Abdel Nasser. But if the Soviets did not, in fact, intrude upon the Middle East until 1955, they have long held historic ambitions to penetrate the area. As long ago as the 10th century, some, from some Scandinavian Russians who called themselves Varangians, organized a Russian dynasty in Kiev. And in the 19th century, there were at least three serious Soviet thrusts southward. In the early part of the century, the thrust was resisted by the British in Persia and Afghanistan. In the middle of the 19th century, uh, when the Russians attempted to exploit the crumbling Turkish Empire, this effort brought on the Crimean War of 1856. And then 22 years later, in 1878, Russian troops again stood threateningly before the walls of Constantinople, and general European war was averted only by sailing the British fleet into the Bosporus and by the subsequent settlement at Berlin. Between World War I and World War II, I think we can say that Russian policy was characterized by isolation. The leadership was preoccupied with the harsh consolidation of the Bolshevik Revolution. It was weak and aware of its weakness. And pursuing Stalin's policy of socialism in one country, it refused to take any risks in the outer world that might jeopardize the home base, which Stalin referred to as the sacred home base in the Soviet Union. Stalin pursued what could be called an intracontinental policy. And such expansionist efforts as were undertaken were limited. They were limited to the areas immediately contiguous to the Soviet borders. And even those thrusts, I think, were defensive in their motivation. Stalin believed uh, in the Leninist theory of capitalist encirclement. But the pre-Bolshevik imperial ambitions did not die. They simply went into hibernation, awaiting the arrival of more favorable conditions, which would signal their revival. And the Russian emergence as one of the great victors of World War II was sufficient to rekindle those old ambitions. Stalin at the Potsdam Conference uh, made several relevant demands in the Middle Eastern area. They included a demand for the annexation of portions of Eastern Turkey, for shared control of the Black Sea Straits, for a Soviet air and naval base on the Bosporus, and finally for a Soviet trusteeship over Libya on the southern shore of the Mediterranean. These historic ambitions were also reinforced by the desire to extend the ideology of communism. The early 1950s, as you know, saw also the general decline of colonial authority throughout the world 
and most especially in the Middle East. French authority in Lebanon and Syria had been eclipsed during the Second World War and never recovered. The pressure of rising nationalism forced Britain to begin negotiating the withdrawal of its military presence from the Suez Canal base. And broadly speaking, there was an increasingly felt need to end colonialism and to come to terms with the new nationalist governments that were coming to being throughout the area. But the trend was complicated by Western Europe's felt need to protect its source of oil and its source in its access to transit through the area for both commercial and strategic purposes. And the trend was also complicated by the existence of Israel, which the Arab world certainly considered an asp in its bosom, but to which the Western powers were committed in terms of the survival and maintenance of that small country. And in the 50s, in retrospect, we can see that Western conflicts tended to play into the Russian hands. Let me briefly describe the situation, the essence of the situation that existed in 1954. The Arabs and Israel were still in a technical state of war, although there was an uneasy ceasefire. The Israeli army was being primarily equipped by the French. Nasser was seeking a reliable source of military arms for two reasons. To modernize the army to maintain the balance with an Israeli force that had beaten the Arabs decisively in 1948. Also to satisfy with military arms the political requirement of his army revolutionary junta. Poor arms and poor supplies were considered to have been the cause of the Arab defeat in 1948 and were one of the principal causes for the uprising by the military caste against the monarchy. It was therefore a political imperative for Nasser to strengthen his army and to modernize it. But he could not get a reliable source of arms from the West. The British stalled because he was unwilling as a condition to the Suez base negotiation to enter into a military alliance with Great Britain and other Western powers. He took the position then and, and retained it throughout his life that it was necessary for the Arabs to achieve a complete independence from the colonial powers. He was not opposed to what later became known as the northern tier defense against Russia. But his insistence was that the northern tier alliance should include no Arab state, that it be confined to membership of states such as Turkey, Afghanistan, Iran, but not Iraq. The United States gave quiet support to the British position and refused Nasser any arms until the completion of the British-Egyptian negotiation. Moreover, Nasser found unacceptable a requirement of our military assistance program, a legislative requirement, which was the acceptance of a military advisory group in the recipient country. He regarded this as incompatible with Egyptian sovereignty. The French refused to give him arms because Nasser was at that time beginning to give moral and the French thought also military support to the Algerian rebels. Israel was at the same time worried by the impending British departure from Suez. It regarded the British military presence there as a buffer, uh, as a protection against an irresponsible Arab military move. Israel was also concerned by Western military arms to Iraq and Jordan because those two countries were still in a technical state of war with Israel. And so you had a situation that, that created great tension on both sides. And a fateful turning point came in late February 1955 in the form of a savage, unprovoked, large-scale Israeli raid on, the, on Gaza. And this, among other things, brought Nasser to the conclusion that he could postpone no longer uh, a determined effort to strengthen his army. He was still strongly oriented to the West, and he made one more effort to obtain American arms, but there was no change in the American position. And finally, in May of 55, he went to a garden party at the Sudanese embassy in Cairo and quietly drew the Russian ambassador aside and said, we want to have arms from you, what will be your answer? 
The Soviets were quite frankly surprised by the overture, but they recovered quickly and began to exploit the opportunity. Private negotiations were begun in the early summer, and in September of 1955, a Soviet-Egyptian arms deal was announced. As you can expect, this had a wide and very unfavorable impact in the West. A very bad reaction in the American Congress, which feared both the expansion of communism in general and Soviet penetration into the Middle East in particular. The French responded by increasing arms to Israel. Nasser did not want to become dependent on the Soviet Union. He had been placed, as it were, in a corner. He wanted independence and a middle position. One of the major pillars of his general program was to improve and develop the very backward and poor Egyptian economy. By 1955, the project called the Aswan High Dam had become, I think, both the engine and the symbol of these efforts to improve the economy. And Nasser wanted very much for the United States and Great Britain to finance that immense project, which would require perhaps 15 years to build and an estimated billion two in money. And so he made an overture, and the Americans and the British responded. Negotiations were started in December of 1955, and they were quite fruitful, although they were, they were not always uh, tranquil. And I won't go into the details about them, but suffice to say that uh, the president of the World Bank, Mr. Eugene Black, after the negotiations in Washington, went to Cairo and succeeded in persuading Nasser that the conditions imposed on the loans and the grants were fair. The trouble was that resistance then began to develop in London and in Washington from several quarters. In Washington, I think there were three sources of trouble. First, the American Zionists who could not be persuaded that it was in the American interest to strengthen the economy of a country still at war with Israel. This was what you might call a predictable and reflexive reaction, and in, in political terms, I think it was the least important. The second source of trouble were the hardline anti-communists who deeply resented neutralism in any form and specifically resented the Nasser arms deal with the Soviets. And the third was a group of southern cotton senators who feared that the Aswan Dam would greatly increase Egypt's cotton acreage and would, in the years ahead, uh, greatly aggravate competition on world markets with the United States cotton. This last was, you might say, a, a remote and far-fetched fear, but in domestic political terms, it was the most important of all. Secretary of State Dulles was also affected by this neutralism argument. He perceived that the United States was then engaged in a worldwide mortal conflict with what he chose to call monolithic, atheistic, international communism. In the circumstances, he felt that neutralism was itself immoral, and that trading with neutrals was somewhat like trading with the enemy. In London, the Prime Minister, Mr. Eden, was becoming opposed to British participation in the Aswan financing for a number of reasons, but what I think finally decided him against it was the dismissal in Jordan of the famous British general Glubb, called Glubb Pasha, who had commanded the famous British trained and British financed Arab Legion. He was dismissed in March of 1956 as a result of pressure from nationalist elements. Eden blamed Nasser. In fact, Nasser had very little to do with it. King Hussein made the decision personally in response to quite internal pressures. In any event, these pressures in their aggregate led Dulles to a very abrupt withdrawal of the Aswan offer on July 19, 1956. He slammed the door in a manner calculated to humiliate Nasser and the Egyptians. And then to the surprise and shock of the Western world, Nasser's dramatic response to this rebuff was to seize the Suez Canal and nationalize it under Egyptian control. The nationalization was impeccably legal. A great deal of consideration was given to compensating the previous owners. But the British and French decided that this was the excuse they wanted and needed to take steps to bring Nasser down. Nasser, they considered, the chief obstacle to the retention of their positions in the Middle East. 
And thus, after three anguished months of international conferences, mostly in London, all inconclusive, Israel, Britain, and France used force against Egypt. The United States condemned the action in the United Nations and by means of very severe economic sanctions forced the withdrawal of all three parties. The result was the gravest kind of strain on the Western alliance. It simply destroyed the intimate trust uh, that had characterized it during the Second War, and I don't think that the Western alliance, by which I mean the big three, uh, has recovered since. In the period after that very profound crisis, we tried to resume our uneasy middle course, but we found it very heavy going uh, because the French and the British had really tarnished the atmosphere. The Soviets used this opportunity to increase their investment and their commitment and their influence. And they began forcing the pace of events in ways that seemed hardly calculated to facilitate an Arab-Israeli settlement. They helped organize something called the United Arab Command in the early 1960s. This was an effort to unify and strengthen a group of Arab armies that were notoriously disunified and weak. And the process was simply to levy upon the individual Arab countries the obligation to raise so many brigades or so many air squadrons, and then to have them buy equipment which was earmarked by the Soviets at cut rate prices. The political dynamic which created the imperative for buying Soviet arms was, of course, the common aim of defending the Arab world against Israel. King Hussein in Jordan strongly resisted the idea of accepting Soviet arms because it carried with it the implication of Soviet advisors. And the command said, in effect, very well, you don't have to take Soviet arms, but you must obtain arms of equal quality, and you cannot have any more money to pay for them. This then resulted in King Hussein having to tour the Western world for the next two years in inconclusive negotiations with the British, the French, and ourselves. When the two European countries proved ultimately unwilling to make price concessions, we very reluctantly uh, agreed to make a modest arrangement for the sale of some secondhand 104s, recognizing that the alternative was Hussein's acceptance of Soviet arms. The point is, that the Soviets were quite willing in 1965 and later to aggravate an already unstable situation by encouraging the steady infusion of arms to Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan. Presumably, they were ready to accept the consequences of a reactive Israeli military buildup, and they considered the risks were manageable. In fact, events began to prove in the spring of 1967 that the risks were unmanageable. There was a series, a whole series of, of increasingly dangerous incidents, uh, which I certainly won't go into, but we might just talk about one as an example. On April the 7th, there was a, an aerial battle over the Sea of Galilee near the Golan Heights, and it resulted in the shooting down of six Syrian aircraft. Shortly thereafter, the Soviet ambassador in Damascus went to the Syrian government and said, the Israeli are mobilizing on the Syrian frontier. In fact, no mobilization took place. But the Syrians were sufficiently disturbed to send their defense minister to Cairo to ask Nasser for reassurances. Nasser called in the Soviet ambassador to Egypt and asked him whether the intelligence reports were true. He replied in the affirmative. The result was Egyptian mobilization in the I think any retrospective analysis suggests that this Soviet action was a, a very irresponsible throwing of lighted matches into haystacks. And the irony is that the Soviets were genuinely distressed by the consequences of that act. 
They were distressed by the removal of the UN peacekeeping force that had separated the combatants. And they were especially disturbed when Nasser seized uh, the, the Strait of Tehran and obstructed what was clearly an international waterway, because this was an act of provocation that the Israeli could not accept. Tension mounted, the Israeli mobilized, and then on June the 5th, 1967, as you know, the Israeli preempted at 5 o'clock in the morning, throwing their entire air force against Egypt and subsequently against Jordan and Syria and achieving a total command of the air in five hours. Well, at the end of that very fierce short war, Israel held a tremendous amount of additional territory. Most of the Sinai, which is nearly as big as New York State, all of the West Bank territory, the Golan Heights in Syria, the city of Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, and this strong point overlooking the Strait of Tehran called Sharm el-Sheikh. When the war began, the gross Soviet miscalculation was revealed. Events proved beyond control. And on the first day of the war, Mr. Kosygin got on the hotline to President Johnson to assure him that the Soviets intended no intervention on behalf of their Arab clients. This became a source, of course, of bitter disappointment to the Arabs. But in short, the Soviets were shocked by the consequences of their own risk-taking. Soviet prestige was dealt a very severe blow by the gross incompetence of the Arab armies who had been both Soviet equipped and Soviet trained. And their first act in that crisis was to ensure against an unwanted confrontation with the United States. After the war, Israel once again demanded explicit Arab acceptance of their existence and sovereignty, and a final peace settlement reached through direct negotiations. The Arab leaders, reeling from defeat, demonstrated once again their perhaps infinite capacity for evading the central question. They said no direct negotiations and indirect negotiations only after the Israeli have withdrawn from the new territories. Finally, in November of 67, the UN produced a resolution which provided two very important reference points which have served as guides to the negotiating efforts since then. They said there must be total withdrawal from the territories taken in 1967. But on the other hand, there must be a termination of all states of belligerency and an acknowledgment of the sovereignty, the territorial integrity, and the independence of all states in the area. It was a very good resolution as these things go, but it failed to get negotiations off the ground. Israel again insisted on withdrawal, uh, on a settlement before withdrawal, and in fact demanded adjustments in the pre-war boundary lines to provide more defensible and more secure boundaries. The Arab position remained adamant. However, the Middle East was then, as a result of these inconclusive exchanges, the beneficiary of a ceasefire that lasted for 20 months. In the spring of 69, the United States opened bilateral talks with the Soviets and, and produced some remarkable Soviet agreement on three points. They agreed, for example, that, that Israel was owed a contractual settlement, that there should be no withdrawal demanded in advance of a settlement, and that final bound boundaries should reflect better defensive positions than had existed before the war in 67. But the Soviets proved unwilling to press these points to exert any pressure on Egypt for their acceptance. And so in the spring of 69, Nasser formally broke the ceasefire, claiming that Israel was simply using the prolongation uh, to consolidate permanently its conquests. He broke it by initiating artillery barrages and occasional infantry raids across the canal. And Israel responded by commencing systematic air raids that began increasingly to penetrate across Egypt until they reached the outskirts of Cairo. And it then became very quickly apparent that Nasser had no capacity to defend against these attacks, that Israel could pummel Egyptian territory with impunity month after month after month, 
And this went on for nearly eight months. At length, it became such a grave political embarrassment to Nasser that he felt compelled to go to Moscow in November of 69 and ask for further Soviet help. And as a result of these talks, the Soviets took some very fateful action. The United States, in an effort to head off further Soviet intervention, came out with a public proposal in 69 that has formed the basis of our effort since then. It was Secretary Rogers' speech at the UN, and it contained three not very uh, different, but nevertheless important points. He called for an explicit return to the 1967 boundaries, a demand that Israel withdraw totally a contractual peace settlement and indirect negotiations, which was a concession to the Arabs, through Ambassador Yaring, who was Secretary Uthant's special representative. Israeli, the Israeli government was sharply critical of this proposal. Uh, they said it was so detailed that it undermined the principle of negotiation between the parties. And they went to the unusual lengths of making a written analysis and circulating it to private American groups throughout the country. In another day, or if another government had been involved, such a move would have been grounds for declaring the ambassador persona non grata. But Israel, of course, uh, has a rather special position in American society. Let me say just a word about the background of this Israeli objection, because it's central, I think, to the whole Israeli position. The peril of the war in 67, the outcome of which was very uncertain, from the Israeli point of view until they preempted, was followed by the heady wine of a very quick victory. And it gave to Israeli post-war policy a new exhilaration and a new hardness. Israel really emerged as a kind of the modern Sparta of the Middle East. She had fought three wars of survival since 1948. She was disenchanted by the uneven support she had received from Western Europe and the United States. She had reached the basic conclusion that she stood alone and had to work out her destiny alone. She possessed clear-cut military superiority. She occupied large chunks of Arab territory. And therefore, she wanted these power factors to operate in a direct way in face-to-face -face negotiations. She wanted, therefore, no great power intervention, not to set guidelines, or to monitor the negotiations, or to guarantee the result. She wanted to be alone in the Middle Eastern cockpit with the Arab enemy. The Americans insisted then, and have continued to insist, that the legacy of suspicion between the Jews and Arabs requires the big powers to define a realistic framework for settlement and to guarantee the settlement that the bitter conflict has become too dangerous to leave to the parties alone. Secretary Rogers has said, peace and withdrawal are the inseparable elements of a lasting settlement. No settlement without withdrawal, no withdrawal without a settlement. Unfortunately, this American position, which was strongly put, did not prevent the Soviets from taking these fateful military acts in the winter and spring of 1970. And as you know, they changed the balance in the Middle East. The Soviets agreed to install and also to operate an advanced anti-aircraft missile system called the SAM-3, the operation of which was really beyond the technical competence of Egypt. And they agreed to put in at least two squadrons of Soviet pilots to fly MiG airplanes carrying Egyptian markings. The result was to neutralize an important Israeli military advantage because it gravely increased the risks of deep penetration bombing. The result was also to deepen Russian involvement in the defense of Egypt, making it very difficult to see how the resumption of large-scale hostilities could exclude Russian participation. In short, it restored a condition of military stalemate, and it was sobering to all sides. In the summer of 1970, the United States again called for a ceasefire, and Egypt, the Egyptians rather surprisingly accepted. 
and so did Israel, but more reluctantly and under pressure. And here we come to one of the recurring irrationalities in the Middle East that makes students uh, of that area sometimes discouraged beyond all hope. When one good thing happens in the Middle East, it is frequently followed by two or three bad things, and the bad things were quick to come. In the first instance, Egypt was found to have violated the ceasefire in the early hours by trying to move the SAM defense line forward of the agreed armistice line. Secondly, the Palestine guerrillas, who feared that a settlement might exclude their interests, hijacked several American and European commercial airliners, flew them to a remote desert area in Jordan, blew them up with high explosives, and imprisoned the passengers. And in the midst of all that, Nasser died. All in all, it was a summer of considerable tumult and outrage. Let me just say a word about the situation in Jordan at that time and subsequently. Jordan has perhaps naturally always had an ambivalent attitude toward the Palestine refugees living on its territory, an honest sympathy for their plight, an awareness that they constituted a political lever to use against Israel in a negotiation, but also an awareness that they constituted a political threat of grave proportions to King Hussein. By 1967, the organization of the guerrillas their political assertiveness, their military armament, was steadily eroding King Hussein's authority. People were referring to him derisively as the mayor of Amman, and he was really hanging on by his fingernails. The hijackings showed clearly that he did not control his own territory. And he determined then, in a critical period, to undo this humiliation. And in September of 70, he sent the Arab Legion against the guerrillas with very bloody and costly results for them. His ability to attack them was greatly strengthened by Nasser's death, because Nasser had been a powerful political protector of the Fedayeen. Today, I would guess that the guerrilla force has been reduced to political and military impotence. Jordan has paid a political price for this in terms of the resentment of other Arab countries who continue to believe that the Palestinian cause is just, but I would suspect that King Hussein, having regained control of his territory, considers this an acceptable price to pay. We come then almost to the present situation and to an assessment of the present issues and what they mean. Last winter, February 1971, Ambassador Yaring took an initiative to bring the parties together in indirect negotiations. He asked that they provide in writing simultaneous and parallel commitments to form the basis of a settlement. And the written responses were really rather interesting and significant. They showed an important shift uh, toward accommodation by the post Nasser government in Egypt. They also showed, I think, a hardening of the Israeli position. Unlike Nasser, Sadat gave a written, firm commitment to terminate all claims and states of belligerency and to accept the sovereign existence of Israel. And while that doesn't seem like much viewed against the history of the past 20 years, it is really a quite remarkable shift. Radio Cairo has, over the last several months, played this theme publicly so that one can say public opinion in Egypt is being prepared for a settlement. He was willing to establish demilitarized zones. He was willing to see a UN peacekeeping force in which Russia and the United States could both participate. He did continue to demand total Israeli withdrawal. The Israeli reply, as I said, was rather less encouraging, primarily because the Israelis said flatly, Israel will not withdraw to the pre-June 5 boundary lines. With these positions defined, and I don't think anyone found them overly encouraging, the United States has since then tried to build the basis of, of what Secretary Rogers calls an interim agreement. And the suggested elements here include a partial 
Israeli pullback from the canal, perhaps 20, perhaps 100 miles. The reestablishment of an Egyptian presence on the eastern bank of the canal, and then the physical clearing of the canal, which is now blocked by sunken ships, and then the allowance of Israeli goods or Israeli merchant ships, but not Israeli warships, to pass through the canal. That would be the first step of an agreement designed to build confidence and to lead to a wider agreement. The Assistant Secretary of State for the Middle East, Joseph Sisko, went to Tel Aviv and Cairo in August with a rather detailed plan for an interim arrangement. The Egyptian response was again quite favorable, although Sadat is understandably concerned that an interim agreement might inadvertently turn into a permanent agreement, leaving Israel in, in occupation of considerable Egyptian territory. Israel is rather fundamentally opposed to an interim agreement. They wish still to force, by the play of existing forces, a permanent settlement which by representing a true and direct agreement between the parties does away with the UN peacekeeping forces and with other international commissions and committees which Israel regards as contributors to misunderstanding, excuses for irresponsibility, and leading to the dangers of further war. And I think we cannot dismiss lightly the Israeli position. Uh, it may, in fact, be the intrinsically right position, although it's obviously going to take a much longer time than an interim agreement. Just two weeks ago, Secretary Rogers made another speech at the UN, which laid out in some detail this interim plan, which had been presented privately. And Israel was very displeased by the public disclosure, because obviously it adds public pressure on them to accept an interim arrangement. Their response has been to press us for the purchase of further F-4 aircraft on the grounds that the Soviets have now promised further military aid to Egypt. I think that is a rather dubious assumption. In any event, that is roughly where matters stand at present. I would like just to try to summarize the present situation and the prospects before us. I find the most encouraging factor in this otherwise dreary and complicated situation is the present military stalemate in which neither side has an appetite for more war. Israel is stretched thin by costly occupation duties and continued partial mobilization, and there are signs of some war weariness inside the country. They are also inhibited by the profound uncertainty as to whether the Soviets will participate if hostilities are resumed. The Arabs are far more divided since Nasser's death. There is no single leader with charisma uh, with a chance of extending the idea of pan-Arabism throughout the Arab world. And owing partly to their disunity, the Arabs alone are no military match for Israel. Also, the Arabs are far more wary of the dangers of Soviet penetration than they were in 1967 or before. I think you have read in the newspapers of the recently attempted communist coup in the Sudan, which was put down summarily by military action, uh, resulting in the execution of a number of local communists. There is every reason to believe that the Soviets inspired that coup and that the Arab world deeply resented it. The Arabs have organized a new federation composed of Egypt, Libya, Syria, and I believe now Saudi Arabia which is basically designed to protect against internal communist subversion. The Russians have been working in some cases through local communist parties, but in other cases through non-communist groups inside the country that nevertheless oppose the existing government. The Arab leaders clearly believe that the danger of, Soviet, of further Soviet penetration would be greater in the event of war because Arab dependence on the Soviet Union would then be greater. We come, I think then, lastly, to the broader question of Soviet intentions in the area. What are their purposes ultimately? 
As I said at the outset, Stalin pursued a rather cautious policy primarily because he lacked the resources to do otherwise. Khrushchev gave the Soviet policy a wider orientation, largely because greater resources and greater technology were becoming available. He shaped or began to shape a political strategy committing the Soviet Union more or less to global competition with the United States. And we have seen as examples of this an enormous growth in Soviet merchant shipping, which now makes the Soviet Union perhaps the second or third largest maritime power. There has been a general growth of Soviet naval forces to protect this shipping and to project Soviet power through the world. We have also seen, of course, a Soviet strengthening of naval forces in the Mediterranean, but I don't believe this has a significant strategic implication. But the Soviets are clearly determined to become a real live global power. They want ability to move their forces around the world as this suits Soviet purposes and where the risks are considered acceptable. We have entered upon, a th I think, a period of classical great power rivalry with them, but one in which the ideological factor is greatly diminished. But clearly, as regards the Middle East, the Mediterranean is no longer an American lake, and we are no longer the sole possessors of strategic mobility. But what does this tell us of ultimate Soviet purposes? For what it's worth, my own judgment is that these may be quite imprecise that they may be compounded of nothing much more than historical impulse, circumstance, perceived opportunity, but no real master plan. I think they are imprecise because there is evidence of real argument and difference inside the Soviet government. For example, Western Europe remains heavily dependent on Middle Eastern oil, and one theory has it that therefore the Soviet interest is to get control of this oil so that in some future crisis it can cut off the flow of oil to Western Europe. Well, this is a plausible Soviet interest. Whether it is realizable is of serious doubt, because it cannot be an interest shared by the Arabs. The oil-bearing countries, like Libya, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Iran, depend for their livelihood on selling oil. And Western Europe and Japan remain the only large markets. The broader truth may well be that there is no basic long-term identity of interests between the Arabs and the Soviets. The Arabs now need a military counterweight, but they detest communism. The Arabs want real unity, but the Soviets cannot really want Arab unity because it would simply make the Arabs more aware of the Soviet intrusion. The Arabs may want another war at the right time, though I seriously doubt this. But the Soviets must be profoundly concerned by the danger of a direct confrontation with the United States. What I'm saying is that on the evidence, the Soviet involvement in the Middle East has been more the result of chance than of plan. The Soviets are in part the prisoner of their Arab clients, just as we long ago became the partial prisoner of the government in South Vietnam. And this is in the nature of client-master relationships. Close Soviet supervision of the Arab armies may be aimed at controlling the irrational tendencies of Arab politics, thereby reducing the risks of real war while maintaining the influence of the Soviet position. But if this is so, it is plainly dangerous to try to thread a course somewhere between supporting and controlling a restless ally. It is a course full of traps and pitfalls. And it's complicated in the case of Egypt by the fact that Egypt has its own sense of imperial destiny and that nothing would be more repugnant to Egypt than to become a Soviet satellite. I think on the negotiating question, by all odds, the toughest issue is the territorial one, the question of territorial boundaries. The Arabs are still demanding total withdrawal to the 1967 borders. But Israel wants annexation of the Golan Heights, annexation of Jerusalem, strict demilitarization of the Sinai Desert, strict demilitarization of the West Bank Territory, but with the proviso that Israel may intervene militarily if need be. 
Israel control of the strong point overlooking Sharm el-Sheikh and Israeli control of the Gaza Strip. All of these positions are unacceptable to the Arabs and this is the hardest point in the negotiations which may be forthcoming. Thank you very much for your patience. While you're reflecting on Mr. Hoops's remarks and framing possible questions, I have an announcement to make. Immediately following this meeting, there will be a reception for Mr. Hoops at the St. Thomas Aquinas Center, sponsored by the Newman Club. This reception will give any of you who choose to come the opportunity to meet individually with Mr. Hoops. My impeccable source tells me that this reception will be held in the uh, downstairs section of, of the uh, center. So if you now have questions, you perhaps will be ready to raise them. Is that the question? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, it was an interesting statement, and I, I won't comment on the statement. Uh, well, I think it depends on your, on your point of view. I, I think that uh, the United States and Western Europe would have said uh, that there was a happier, stabler, more tranquil situation when the Russians were not in the Mediterranean. Uh, the presence uh, of Soviet and American forces in the Mediterranean at the same time uh, present always uh, the danger, however slight, of an incident. Uh, and therefore, I'd, I don't really see the logic uh, of the argument that this contributes to stability. I think in the, in the broader context, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, that the intervention of the Soviet pilots and the SAM missile system in Egypt has restored a military stalemate. And to that extent, there is a stabilization in the situation between Egypt and Israel that may lead to negotiation. Sir. Uh, you uh, briefly mentioned the Palestinians and the extent that they were staying the Palestinian refugees and they were staying in Jordan. Uh, can you tell us something about the Palestinians and their background and how they came to Well, I am not an Arabist, and therefore uh, my answer, I think, will be rather superficial. Uh, but the Palestinian refugees, for the most part, oh, 
I beg your pardon. The question is, uh, can you tell us something about the background of the Palestinian refugees? The Palestinian refugees uh, occupied the land that has now become Israel. Uh, they were ejected from their homes. Uh, their insistent claim is that they must be allowed to return. It seems to me that in the nature of things, this is an unsatisfiable claim because Israel is not going to give way on its territory. It therefore is a claim that must be satisfied by other means, by resettlement and by financial compensation. And this has been an issue, as you know, uh, discussed inconclusively since 1948. It is still, a, will be a, a major obstacle in any serious negotiation. The back of the room. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. 